Welcome to my second special interview edition of C++ Weekly. I still do not plan to make interviews a regular part of this channel, but if you are interested in being interviewed, feel free to contact me. Today I'll be interviewing Felix Jones about his work on Minecraft, modern Game Boy Advance development, and the role of Kunst Expert in his work. Felix is gameplay tech lead for Minecraft Bedrock Edition. He was previously a game developer for Minecraft Java Edition. He started his career and game development journey from a young age using RPG Maker, working with Game Boy Advance Homebrew since 2016. He is maintainer of the AGB ABI application support library for GBA, used by several GBA Homebrew projects. Currently working on the GBA toolchain project, allowing CMake projects to target the GBA and developing the GBA HPP library, a header-only C++20 library for writing GBA homebrew software. So welcome and thank you for joining me today, Felix. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for having me. You reached out to me. I want to I mention this since I do say if you're interested in being interviewed, you reached out to me to talk about this Game Boy development. Um, but I feel like you're probably a better well known on Twitter and in public circles because of your involvement in Minecraft. So I'm kind of curious about the history there. Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone knows Minecraft. It's the most popular game on the planet, practically. Um, <laughs> Is it literally the most popular game on the planet? It's one of the biggest. Probably not. I, I, there's a good amount of people who don't like Minecraft that it's probably not 100% popular, but uh, right. it's one of the biggest games on the planet, I'd say. Um, so yes, I, I, I joined uh, Mojang Studios, the studio behind Minecraft. Um, ooh, it was probably back in January 2020, so this is coming into my, well, it's my third year at, at the studio working on Minecraft. And okay. I was actually hired um, to work on the Java edition of the game, which... Uh, is a completely different language to Bedrock Edition, which is the C++ code base. And uh, I was hired for 3D graphics expertise. And uh, that's pretty much how I got into, into Minecraft, Mojang, everything. So before that moment, were you primarily a Java developer or a C++ developer? <laughs> Both, Android <Okay>. NDK. <laughs> ah, I see. So I, I worked on Android apps and my specialty was 3D graphics programming using NDK to uh, bind with the Java side of an Android application. So okay. for the perfect middle ground, Java, C++, and then translated perfectly into what Mojang needed. Uh, in my experience that... Um... I, I know it's not fair to call Java a scripting language, but just work with me here. <laughs> that C++ plus scripting language, uh, if you will, binding that cross language interaction is a relatively unique specialty. It's strange that the the application starts as Java and like that's hosting your C++. So it, right. I'm so used to an int main and then and then you kick off your scripting engine, you kick off your virtual machine and off you go. But it's so strange in Android where you're starting in the Java side, uh, unless you go pure NDK, but even then there's some Java backend stuff secretly starting up your application. It, it's a, it, is, it is a strange paradigm shift, especially when you're trying to bind a Java class with your internal C++ state and you're having to keep reference and it, it can get into a mess very quickly. Did you ever use Swig or any of those binding tools to help facilitate that Ooh, kind of thing? I learned that a lot of binding tools produce, they, they seem like they're tailored for teams of more than one person and I'm a single person. So whenever I used a binding tool, it produced so much code that got in the way. It was faster right. to just write the literally the JNI signature and say, that's my entry point. Here I go. I've used Swig extensively, but to be fair, if, you, if performance on the language binding interface is your primary concern, most of those binding tools are going to generate way more boilerplate generic yeah. code that you don't need. Yeah. And when doing a 3D graphics engine, uh, the performance is kind of important, especially when there, there is actual overhead, even down to JNI, there's, there is overhead for each C++ call. So you need to do as much work natively as possible before you return. Right. 
So are there still, and stop me if I ask too many questions here about Minecraft, but are there still two different versions of Minecraft maintained? I have to admit, I've literally never played it, but all of my nieces and nephews have. So there's oh, that. Shocker. So you never play with your nieces and nephews. You, you let them play Minecraft, you don't go near it. That's not your game. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't <laughs> spend enough time in the same you know, environment that they, but as kids, they would all be out there with whatever device they happen to have. They'd all be sitting in the living room, like playing together in the same mm -hmm. shared world. It was pretty cool. And that's what's special about Bedrock Edition, which is the uh, later version of Minecraft. So we have the original Java edition from uh, 2009. And that right. was the, that was the original Minecraft. Uh, but when it came to needing a mobile port later on, uh, Pocket Edition required a native language. And then when we, when we wanted players to be able to play with each other, together on their worlds, uh, Pocket Edition could be ported to all the other platforms, to the, to the consoles. So that became Bedrock Edition, which is now the most popular edition of Minecraft. Okay. But if you still wanted to, you could go download the Java version. Oh, yes. And it's kept up to date. We, I was in the Java team when I started at Mojang. So Java Edition right. is alive and well, and we maintain both code bases and try to stick and keep in parity with the features. Well, for the sake of C++ Weekly, I'm just going to assume that you're happier on the C++ edition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for the sake of C++ Weekly, yeah, let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you said that you were hired because of your 3D expertise, right? Yes, now, I'd, I'd say that. I think we, you and I have had some interaction on Twitter about this because I kind of was looking into OpenGL at some point recently, and but then other people tell me, oh no, don't start with OpenGL, start with, shoot, what's it called? The newer stuff. Vulcan? Yeah, start with Vulcan. And oh. I look at Vulcan and a, a boilerplate Hello World Vulcan program is like 10,000 lines of yes. code. And I said, I don't even want to bother with this. Like Yes. Yeah, uh, e even the Vulcan community themselves tend to admit that it's a uh, far too verbose. Um, uh, that's that's kind of the power of Vulcan, though. You tell the graphics driver precisely what you want, and the graphics driver knows how to optimize for that. Um, but certainly, I, I wouldn't give that advice uh, for anyone learning. I would I would say stick with OpenGL. Even OpenGL one fixed function. Um, a lot of people will say it's cursed. Don't use it. Uh, but it's really good for an entry point because people are used to the sequential logic of a C program where right. they see I'm going to have going to have some vertices and they're going to render at this point here. It's not how it actually works in the driver, but OpenGL fixed function gives that, that feeling to a programmer. From there, you can learn shaders and then upgrade yourself to something like OpenGL 3, go, go more shader based, less, uh, more programmatic. And then you'll get the taste of what Vulkan is about, uh, especially okay. when you get to the bind less. OpenGL of a uh, four four point five, I think it's at now, um, and then I'd say maybe give Vulcan a try after that. So after you've spent four years doing OpenGL programming, <laughs> it shouldn't take four years. You could get started very quickly. It's about okay. teaching the fundamentals. So OpenGL one will teach you very quickly how to get a triangle going, um, but then you'll the next step of the tutorial is uh, upload your vertices to the GPU in a in a vertex buffer. Um, and then you'd move on to OpenGL 2 to achieve that. And you'd see, okay, shaders, they're popular. And then you move on and then step-by-step step, within nine months, you'll be on Vulkan. Okay. So is there like, uh, I guess I'm just kind of curious, like how, how do you limit yourself? If you say, no, no, I'm just going to do OpenGL because I want to stay in a simple world. Does that still support it on most devices? Am I, am I boxing, boxing myself into a corner or anything like that? On most devices, so um, a lot of so it, it, on Apple devices, OpenGL is uh, in a deprecated position at the moment. But oh, there's of course it is. There's bindings for to run OpenGL on D3D or on Vulkan, and that to me says OpenGL has become a learning API. It's an okay. API to help you get started on graphics. It's no, it's no longer the bare metal writing to the writing to the driver. Um, but it's perfectly acceptable to use it as it's, it's, I believe the API has been kept up to date as well. So it's still perfectly acceptable to use OpenGL for learning. I'm sorry, I have to clarify if I heard you correctly. You're saying if I write OpenGL code today, I'm actually, that's actually being written to the Vulkan layer. <laughs> De depending on the platform. So on the, on the PC architecture, you still have NVIDIA, AMD, they still produce Intel as well. They still produce OpenGL drivers. I okay. believe the latest Intel GPUs 
do not, but they provide the translation layer OpenGL to their uh, their inner language. Huh. Um, but on on some some platforms like uh, Apple, Apple is the example. Uh, you'd need to run something like a GL on Vulkan. Um, another another good tool is uh, Google have the Angle library. Uh, I've been looking into that a whole bunch. So later, Microsoft devices, the services, they they don't support OpenGL. They only support D3D. Okay. Um, whereas the Google Chrome has uh, the Angle library for running uh, GLES for WebGL. Okay. Um, but that needs to run on Windows as well. So their Angle library will translate uh, GLES uh, for WebGL to D3D. So that still, OpenGL survives. That strikes me as, uh, you know, why use one of the existing standards when you can create another one kind of <laughs> scenario? Well, luckily, Kronos only publishes two, OpenGL and Vulkan, and GLES, okay, three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so before we uh, now get to the Game Boy development, which we, we really need to do that, but I am kind of curious because you said that you started with RPG Maker, and RPG Maker... Like I, I own RPG Maker because of a humble bundle, <laughs> wow. right? Like <laughs> everyone has a copy, right? Or something, some old version of it or something. Um, I don't know. Like, uh, and I saw you just tweet about how one of your earliest plugins that you ever wrote <laughs> is still like, it, you didn't know it had taken on a life of its own, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Just, do you want to share any of your experiences there? Yes. So I consider RPG Maker to be a fantastic uh platform for learning game development and programming in general. So I credit the RPG Maker event system, which is a, it's not quite visual scripting, but it's double click. Here's a menu of all the options you can add and you click an option and then you have the line of code is written. It's not actually editable text, but it's there in a, uh, in a sort of list of what conditions you're adding. And then you can have branching, um, that taught me so much about programming at the age of 11, 12, 13, that okay. it, it, I credit it massively for my head starts. Um, so you child. learned logic and control flow, basically. Precisely. And because it looked like a actual programming language, when I then later saw real programming, real programming languages, um, I think at the time Ruby script was uh, what RPG Maker had. So it would have been XP. Um, when I saw that, I thought this is this is no longer the hieroglyphs I thought it was. This is familiar to me now because I'm so used to the, the baby's first event system. So I, even to this day, I still promote RPG Maker for learning if anyone wants to get started with coding. That's cool. Yeah, and it seems like it has had an active community for decades or something oh, at this yeah. point at least, right? Very old now, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think they're now using, oh, I know that they're now using JavaScript um, and that's what the plugin I was referencing on Twitter was about. It's one of my first JavaScript plugins. Um, okay. Accidentally ran away and loads of people are using it, it turns out. <laughs> um, but I'm also the author of a uh, Android publishing tool. Um, so that uses hmm. uh, that uses the web web view for Android to render your RPG Maker game on, on mobile. That, that turns it, out to be pretty popular too. Does it have to have an active internet connection to do that? Or did you, is it download it's, the game locally or? My, my tool bundles all the, uh, all the HTML assets, all the JavaScript, and it runs, um, I think it's a version of Node.js that's designed for publishing. It's like NWJS. Um, okay. It's, I, I had never heard of it until I found it in RPG Maker um, and everything's done locally. That's cool. So RPG Maker was your intro to game development. You still recommend that. Uh, yes. Very good. And uh, what did you do after RPG Maker? Ooh, I think that's when I was trying to actually learn uh, programming for real. So that would have been high school um, visual basic.net, I think it was. Okay. Um, and, and I still had the urge that I wanted to make a game. Um, but I knew that I didn't have the skills to do the fantastic games that all these publishers are, are producing all the time. So I had to boil it down to something closer to the RPG Maker level. I knew how to do logic. I knew how to do a bit of the, the graphics. Um, and what I ended up doing was finding the simplest, I wanted to make a 3D game. So I had to try and find the simplest 3D possible. And that's when I kind of stumbled upon the concept of ray casting. Okay. And uh, one of the first one of the first projects I did for Visual Basic.net was uh, I took a, a ray casting engine 
Um, it was written by uh, Lode, uh, Lode van der Ven. Um, he has a wonderful tutorial for writing a raycaster. And to this day, it's still my hello world. If, if you give me a frame buffer, that's the raycaster I'm going to write. Nice. And it goes all the way back to my early days with uh, Visual Basic.net. Uh, so that's, I think his website's uh, lowdev.org. And I think his tutorials are still up there. If I recall correctly, you were uh, giving lots of input while I was hacking on my Python Raycaster a few months ago <laughs> on my live streams. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Because uh, at one point, I realized you're doing um, line intersection raycasting. Like, yes. um, so the Unity Engine style raycast. Um, which Take is, your word for it. <laughs> it completely different to what I was used to. So I had to I had to duck out of that chat when I realized I was giving terrible advice. No, no, no. <laughs> it, was, it was good though, because I'm like, wait, oh, you know, hold on. There's someone who actually knows what they're doing, and I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, it was impressive. It, your it was technique just... would have been perfect for. You had angled walls, and it would have been perfect yes. for spherical uh, pillars. Um, yes. So a lot better than the Wolfenstein 3D style. I just actually, I ported it to C++ now and I have a little bit oh, yeah. of light fall off going on. So it's got, Oh, uh, that's fantastic. Just, I mean, just, just so that you give a little bit extra perspective kind of fall mm. off from the point of view of the camera. Interestingly, one of the tricks that, um, I think doom uses, uh, doom definitely uses it. And I think Wolfenstein kind of pioneered it is to, depending on the, um, cardinal angle of the wall, so North, South, East, West. It'll right. darken uh, the cob the different size. So the north and the south side will be darker than the west and east. Okay. Just by doing that, the visibility of the world is, is so much more improved. The readability. So from a distance, just doing that, you, the player will be able to discern all the angles of the walls. Otherwise, the lighting's flat. And we use that trick in Minecraft as well for all the blocks. Nice. <laughs> and the amount of bugs that that's caused me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, you moved on to visual basic development. I, I won't, you know, uh, interrogate you about your entire programming <laughs> history here. Uh, though it is fascinating, truly, how many people say, I want to get into programming because I want to might write games. Hmm. And so now you're working on the most popular game in the world. Let's just go ahead and we'll just proclaim it the most popular yeah. game in the world. I mean, it's what I do. Yeah, okay. And... <laughs> <laughs> but you're you're looking backward, if you will, to Game Boy Advance development. So how did you get involved in that? Why did you decide you want to do GBA uh, Homebrew? I, I I barely remember because um, so the the GBA is from my childhood, and okay. it was a very special console to me. A uh, lot of great memories, um, and I must have stumbled upon something that. So I must have stumbled upon some homebrew or some example of GBA software. And I, I must have thought, I know how to write software now. Why not go for the GBA? So I, that's probably what happened. Because when I look back, I have no idea how, how I got started. But I'm, I'm glad I did because it feels like, it's a, feels like when I'm coding for the console, it's like a love letter to my childhood. It's mm -hmm. like I'm looking at past me and saying, look what you're able to do on your old favorite device. You wouldn't have dreamed of doing this. And now here that's I am. Cool. That's a fun way to look at that. <laughs> um, so when was the Game Boy released? GBA, uh, I mean. The GBA was um, 2001, I believe. Um, okay. And the original Game Boy would have been 1998. But architecturally, they are completely different. Wait, the original Game Boy was 98? No, that's um, not right. 90, no, 1989. 89. The Game Boy <laughs> Color was 98. Okay. Go. Okay. I'm like, I, I am much older than that. And my friends had game boys. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so you started doing game boy development, but now you, uh, you're doing it in modern C++, right? That's the point of this interview. So let's just go ahead and dive into that. Um, uh, what do you mean by modern C++? How does this come into play in your game boy development? So uh, all the tutorials for GBA, they're all in, um, C and the recommendation was C, um, and that's where I went. So I knew C++, but I took myself back. I'll write in C because that's what everyone says is correct. And when I saw the output of C++ at the time, I thought this is terrible. Of course, you'd be crazy to use C++ or the, or the libraries. It's a complete mess. Um, but then I discovered const expo with C++ 11. Mm -hmm. And I realized that all the mess that was being generated in our, in our debug builds could just be moved to compile time. So that was when it was 
that was the moment of C++ is extremely viable. Modern C++ is extremely viable on this embedded system, this tiny console of a puny processor. Um, and that, that was, that was pretty much it. So the entire C++ standard then opened up and, uh, I think the community has done quite a lot with it since. So you're, you're not a, like a rogue at this point. C++ is relatively common in GBA development now. There's a handful, there's a handful of people say, don't use it still. Um, but <laughs> the most popular, uh, engine from the community, uh, it's called Butano. Um, okay. And that's the C++, uh, I think it's C++ 20 as well. And that's when people want to make a game for the GBA, we tend to direct them to use Butano because that's more complete and that has quite a lot of tooling and it's almost one click to build your game at that point. Oh, wow. Um, but there's quite a few other languages being used. Uh, there's some projects in NIM as well. Okay. Uh, there used to be a Lua runtime, but I think most people have learned to not use that. Have learned to not use that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think that we could probably do a lot more. Uh, and at this point, because Clang targets the 32-bit ARM devices as well, anything that targets LLVM is, is game here. Right. So, uh, Bhutan, that's what you said? Butano. I believe it's Butano, uh, sorry. Spanish for butane. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> of course. Yes. So, uh, what C++ standard does it use? Um, I think Butano uses 20, but I'm not quite sure. It's the oh, same. Wow. It's definitely Constexpo because um, at the same time, we, we all realize Constexpo is the way forward um, for, <sighs> quite frankly, for any embedded platform. Um, and seeing it be proposed for C was quite exciting, actually, um, even though it's in a limited form for now. Um, but uh, I found that uh, I've started using a lot of G uh, GNU extensions um, and that's something that's not many people in the community have looked into. Uh, okay. There's quite a few hidden things that seem to benefit embedded platforms. That's not many people have uh, spotted yet. That's interesting. We'll have to get to that in just a moment here. Um, extensions. Okay. So I, 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 you know, I, I don't know really what I was expecting here, but I'm definitely a little bit taken back by the fact that you're saying, of course, the community agrees that C++ 20 and all the constexts, but that has to offer is the right way forward here. I still get into conversations with people that are like, I just don't see the point in constexts for it has nothing to gain in my code. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it's been like a 12 year journey or so. No, no, I'm exaggerating. It's been a five year <laughs> journey of me trying to like convince people to use more constexpr. So you've, you've got to sell it. exonerate me here. Like, <laughs> tell me, tell me why constexpr is so obvious in your Game Boy development. Um, it was the, it was the first thing was the debug builds. So when you, you can write, you could be very expressive with what you're trying to say, but you're when you compile for debug, the compiler is going to take you incredibly literally. And mm -hmm. on an embedded system, that's your, you, we have 32 megabytes of ROM, which is quite a lot for a retro console. Um, but you right. can lose it quite a lot from, especially when you need to pack some of that into the uh, 256K of memory. A lot of it is lost to C++, uh, just random overhead um, and if the more you can do, the more you could pack into that 32 megabytes at compile time, uh, the easier it is to pack even more stuff later on um, when you're clamoring for more space. So what kinds of things like specifically can you do at compile time that save you here? So a lot of, um, a lot of retro consoles don't have floating point units and don't have very powerful mathematics. Um, so you need a lookup table. And generally in the past, the way we generated lookup tables, it was pick a scripting language, pick or, or write another C program entirely, and then do all your logic for generating a lookup table there, then write it out to a binary file, include it as a header, as a, well, convert it into a, an assembly source file, convert it to a header file, um, include that. And now you have your, now you finally have your, your opaque entry into what you're saying is a lookup table, but it's just okay. a memory address. Um, with context, but all that logic for generating lookup table could be done right in the code where you need it. But more than that, 
what if you don't need so much precision in a fixed point number in certain areas of your code? Instead of generating two different lookup tables, you now have the same logic for generating one lookup table. You just change the templates input to say precision 16 instead of 12 or something. Now you have an entire second lookup table. Um, it goes well beyond that. So uh, with these consoles, you need uh, sprites, you need graphics. We can now uh, define that in compile time. So if you are mm. if you just want to throw up a character onto the screen, then you could just define a, a const string and just have your, you can use like the return character to say next row and you have individual pixels to find an ASCII. And before you know it, you have a character on the screen without needing a paint program, without needing a conversion tool, without needing to convert to header file, C file, assembly files. Um, so the whole thing is just so much easier with uh, const expo around. Nice. So in the case of your lookup tables, if I heard you correctly, you might end up with two copies of the lookup table with two different sets of precision, both embedded in the read-only data and the binary. Hmm. And what, uh, what const expo also gives you, if you are at compile time indexing into that lookup table, yes. then const expo will allow you, will allow the compiler to optimize the entire lookup table and just give you that one value. Right. So even if you are generating multiple tables at compile time, some of them will just vanish. So how often do you uh, actually have that ability to do a compile time lookup into a compile time lookup table? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a great example, and I've, I've been writing a Doom style renderer recently, and that uses a lookup table to convert the angle that the player is facing um, with a given... So it's angle to point on the screen. So an angle that the player is facing converts it to where would that be projected on the screen if there was a point in infinite space. It makes sense on the Doom engine. Okay. Um, <laughs> but every now and then I need to know what about the middle of the screen, what about a quarter way. So I will have the, the hard-coded number give me it at 45 degrees. Um, you wouldn't use degrees, you'd use binary angles. Um, but then that's that's an instance, and you'd have a comparison against that. So if angle's less than the 45 degree in this lookup table, and then right. that's optimized into just the number. Nice. And then that works regardless of debug or release builds. Oh, yes, yeah. You can set, um, I think, O0 will still put out the entire table. Um, but OG, just like wonderful. Like the code is still debuggable, and yet everything has just vanished into a very small amount of space. Yeah, OG is, uh, that's great that you mentioned that because not very many people are familiar with it. That is, GCC is better at OG still, I think, than Clang. I know that historically that was true. Hmm. And that's optimized for debugability, right? Yes, yes. There is still, um, if you have unused variables, it'll still optimize those away, which can be frustrating when you just want to step to see the result of a variable but now you need to write a printf statement or now you need to write a do not optimize or heap statement or something. Okay. Um, but other than that, OG is fantastic. If you do a printf in Game Boy development, GBA <laughs> development, where does it go? Who knows? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that being, that being said, um, emulators these days uh, provide a console output, um, but it's not quite printf. Um, you could probably hook up, depending on the... Uh, runtime, you could probably hook up printf to work, but the my favorite emulator, MGBA, um, MGBA. that has its own API where if you write to certain memory addresses, it'll give you an answer back, and then you know I'm in MGBA land. I could write to another memory address, and I know, and I know, I now know anything I put in there is going to appear on the console. Okay. Um, so we have we do have a printf state uh, kind of situation going on, um, and that's perfectly fine for just a Hello world to the to the console as a first program. So that's uh, actually I didn't even think about that as for the setup of this interview. You so you do most of your development on an emulator, I assume. Then yes. So my setup is I have C line compiling um, with the ARM official tool chain, and I've set up my uh, configuration to connect to a I think it's a GDB remote session. Um, or just or GDB embedded. It's a very useful tool in C line that I don't think many people know about. And that allows MGBA to report, I'm a GDB server. If you're going to connect to me, then I'm going to start giving you all the symbols and all the addresses that are 
that's running nice. through the emulator. And it, it, it changes the game as well. So there's a lot of people in the community don't even use a debugger and they're still using console output or putting a pixel to the screen. Um, but as soon as you have a debugger connected, you're developing about 20 times faster. Wow. I was uh, just thinking, it seems um, game, uh, game Boy Advance has got to be one of the lower barriers to entry for uh, retro game devs since, as you pointed out, it's ARM32 and every compiler certainly. supports ARM32. Mm. Yeah, certainly. I, it's one of the most interesting retro devices because it feels like it's on the it's on the precipice between the classic style assembly writing to hardware registers but yet we have all these modern tools we have modern compilers that can target this thing so you get the you get the full experience of what it was like on the retro hardware with completely modern tools and it feels like any device either side of the gba doesn't have that so it's the one console i feel captures the sweet spot awesome and you said it's only like a, a couple of lines and you can get going with uh, Butano? <laughs> um, Butano is a bit more complicated, but with uh, my library, GBA HPP, um, okay. it is is about three three lines I think you could get going um, for an output. Maybe four, because you need to actually enable MGBA. Yes, so four lines, and that's including the closing brace. And at what point, what do you, what do you have on the screen or whatever, after those four lines that you're talking Absolutely about? nothing. Okay. Uh, but if you were to go to the console, you'll see your output being repeated over and over again. Uh, uh, because... on the, on the uh, MGBA console. Yes, that's correct. Um, okay. that's because the, <laughs> in my, in my head, those, those three lines didn't include, um, a, a, an infinite loop to capture, uh, the program flow. So in my um, tool chain, um, I've written a runtime for specific for ROMs. And when main exits, it'll do a bit of cleanup, but then it'll jump back to the start of the program and repeat. Okay. So in that, those amount of lines, you'll have repeated output. And do you have uh, then console access, or excuse me, um, frame buffer or what? What does it look like right <laughs> into the screen? Ooh, there's choices. Um, <laughs> so the GBA... Um, technically it doesn't have a frame buffer, but it has bitmap modes. Um, okay. and there's three bitmap modes and you can choose between pallets or you could choose between, well, it's pallets with two pages to flip. So you could write on page a while page B is being displayed and then you can flip them. Um, but then there's also direct color where it's a 15 bit bitmap and you can, uh, it's 240 pixels by 160 and you can write directly to that. Okay. Uh, then there's a third bitmap mode, which not many people use, and that's a lower resolution, uh, but you have the full color access with two pages to flip. Um, a, a, a good demonstration for that would be to take that lower resolution, but then use other GBA registers to stretch it out to complete the uh, full console uh, window size. Okay. So is it the, um, like... You know, so I, I, I've done some played with Commodore 64 stuff. I've read mm. up on the hardware of the NES. Familiar with um, character graphics? Yeah. So like, do you, do you, do you, is it a sprite based system primarily? Like what, what, how are most games actually written for the GBA? Um, it's tile based. So with tile characters, based. um, okay. so you'll so, have three, there's three tile based modes, um, each with different amount of background layers and you can allocate some video memory um, to say, I'm going to use this much memory to define the actual tile map, maybe a bit more to say what the tiles even look like. Um, but then on top of all of that, you have the sprites, which can display on top of any kind of background. It could be frame buffer, it could be tile map, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can always have sprites around. Okay. So it sounds like you could do relatively easily like parallax scrolling oh, yes. or something with multiple layers and then your sprites, your character moving across the tiles or whatever. Yep. It's one of the best retro consoles because of the four background layers. It's quite liberating, strangely. Um, but then there's also magic tricks like a H blank interrupt. So you can scroll a background while it's still drawing. So you can have even more parallax than before and you could do a pseudo 3D effects. So yes, yeah, so it does fantastic. not have any actual 3D hardware. Uh, no, it's all 2D hardware, but uh, if you, it has a, a fine uh, background layers. Uh, so if you were to set the 
a fine transform matrix for a background at every horizontal blanking line, you can end up, you can sort of pseudo tilt the perspective of the map just by, in this horizontal line, it'll tile, it'll map out these pixels here, but then in the next one, it'll map out those and you can build up a sort of 3D plane. Okay. All, all in hardware. It's quite fantastic. All right. So I feel like for the sake of whoever's watching this later, we should take <laughs> maybe just a little bit of a step back from a hardware perspective. Now I'm used to like the NES, like, yeah, you, so each as, as the, um, as the photon gun is moving across the <laughs> screen or whatever, or like for electron gun, not photon gun, as mm -hmm. it's moving across the screen, uh, then you've got a, a horizontal blank period that you have where nothing's being drawn to the screen. And then the next line is drawn. Then once the entire screen is drawn, you have a V blank period at the bottom, right? Yep. Okay. If you know anything at all about how NTSC or PEL draws to a CRT, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm slightly confused that we're having this conversation. We're talking about a device that was designed only for drawing to an LCD. LCD. Panel. Yep. That's that's one of the strange things about LCD panels is that they tend to emulate CRTs. And uh, okay. it was to the benefit of Nintendo because they were able to include all of these uh, graphical tricks um, that they were used to with the CRT displays. So if you do your timing just perfectly, you have an H blank at the end of each line where you can switch mm -hmm. modes and do crazy tricks. Okay. Yep. There's also IRQ interrupts. So if you, you can set up an interrupt to happen at every H blank, um, you can, I think you can also have one trigger at particular vertical lines, uh, V count maybe, uh, but then there's also one for the vertical blanking as well. So you can, you could dedicate a chunk of code just to, just to H blank operations. So how well does all this work with your library? Can I, can I take a <laughs> Lambda and say on this IRQ, I want you to call my Lambda? Like, so that's that? what's special about my library. Yes. Uh, okay, with get into HPP, it. Yes. Yeah. You can set up a, you can literally give it a Lambda and it'll, it'll run that at a, at interrupt, which is nice. It's quite, quite liberating. Cause usually you're used to defining all your interrupt routines somewhere else, or you build your own switch switchboard table setup. I feel so many C++ developers will be used to lambdas. So why not speak the language of C++ instead of trying to send them down the traditional C route? Uh, so it's quite important for me to get the lambda support working. There's, there is a lot of overhead with capture. Um, but I was wondering. I, I hope that the developer knows that and can accept that. So if you, if you use a lambda that has captures, then there's more overhead. Yes, there's a there's quite a bit more overhead. Um, it can be acceptable if you're just sending in a pointer, um, but anything anything that's very local will start blowing up the um, <laughs> the stack, which of which there isn't much. Uh, the, the recommendation I give is to use a global static. It sounds evil, um, but yeah. in in retro consoles, your device it, it should be fine. <laughs> you you like need to get a game built. <laughs> 99% of interrupt handling code I've ever seen has relied on globals because otherwise trying to pass state into the interrupt handler is just mm. painful. It's, it's fantastic that the, that a C++ Lambda can handle that for you. Um, but yes, you can tell that it's painful because of the amount of overhead that it creates. And now is that because you actually have to copy the Lambda into the current stack before you can execute it or something? Yes. Yeah. And. Copying is not exactly the fastest thing when you have 16 megahertz. <laughs> awesome. Which, which is interesting because I'm also uh, known in the community for writing the fast mem copy that everyone uses because I, I decided to break the rule. Mem copy was too slow and I spent a long time optimizing it and uh, we've got it to the point where it's incredibly fast on the GBA now. Yeah, that's think... not the kind of thing people normally say. Exactly, yeah. It's... I. I when you when you're optimizing mem copy, something's gone horribly wrong, or you're on the Game Boy Advance. <laughs> so your hand optimized version, how much faster is it than the like uh, glib C or whatever that you had? So uh, glib is incredibly slow because they have to assume the worst. They they can't make any assumptions about the hardware, so they almost always end up doing a byte by byte copy. Um, right. On the GBA, you can do because uh, the ARM CPU is 32 bits. You can load up 32 bit. Uh, 30, 32 bits at a time, copy those, that's fine. But it has uh, instructions for um, pushing and uh, it's, I think it's called load multiple 
L. So it's loading multiple reg uh, registers, storing multiple registers. So okay. you know your source pointer, one instruction will fill your registers um, with whatever's in the, whatever your source pointer is pointing to. Okay. Then another instruction will store all those registers in whatever your destination pointer is pointing to. Okay. So with that, you can start to really speed things up. And I so think you, that, you can't use all 32 registers because you'd be stepping on the program counter and yeah, stuff. Yeah, how many registers are there? Um, I believe there's 16 registers, actually. Oh, 16. Um, okay, my mistake. And you can use about, I think, tw up to 12 of them are safe. But okay. yes, then you get into the link register, program counter, stack pointer. Um, right. But that being said, um, the ARM CPU and the GBA has other operation modes intended for devices that weren't the GBA. Um, and one of them is fast IRQ. And one of my mem copy implementations will switch the CPU into that mode and then we'll take full advantage of the link and stack register because we know we're never going to use those. So they've become mem copy registers now. So you're copying 40 plus bytes per instruction, basically. Per two, two instructions, so per loading two, and storing. Right, right. But uh, mem set is even faster because that's just one instruction for store. Okay. Huh. And I believe it's yeah. it's faster than the direct memory access uh, hardware as well. That doesn't sound like that should be the case. Yes, it's strange, isn't it? But that's uh, I think it's because the DMA still goes across the uh, the DMA on the GBA still uses pointers and it still goes across a bus to retrieve what was it I'm about to store? Oh, it's this, and then it pulls it. Okay. But from the CPU, it just goes across one bus directly into where you're putting it. One instruction. So Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> uh, are there uh, C++ features that you just simply can't use or limitations you've reached with the standard or? Hmm. So <laughs> I've been trying to use C++ coroutines. Um, they, they seem to break in the strangest ways for me, and I haven't quite figured out why, and I still need to debug those. Um, so as a result, I ended up implementing my own coroutine uh, solution. Um, I saw that coroutine header in your examples before we... <laughs> yes, I, I, I completely... <laughs> I looked at what Boost did, and I thought that's a really good API. Um, so I slimmed it down for exactly what the GBA can handle. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea, coroutines. I'm, I've become quite a fan of them from just implementing them that one time. Oh. Um, but as for other features... Um, uh, I the the bit cast of C plus plus that's that was a, almost a game changer for me. Um, okay, C plus twenties bit cast, yeah, which that... I'm repeating for the sake of our listeners. <laughs> uh, it's in the bit header that was added in C plus plus twenty. Yes. yes, that's that really changed things because uh, before we were using uh, we were using macros in C to kind of define where 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 are our registers. And then the register types would have to be volatile integers or volatile shorts, volatile chars. Right. Um, as soon as Bitcast kind of came into it, I realized we can now use actual structures with actual real fields. Hmm. And instead of instead of having to, we, we can now basically mem copy it as if it was an integer into the register. So we can treat it all as if a C++ programmer traditionally would with any kind of structure. Okay, so you've got your memory mapped registers that you want to treat as a data structure. You do a bit cast from that specific address, right? That's what you're saying, into a data yes. structure. Now, in my playing around with bit cast, I often see that GCC is great at removing that bit cast and just doing a direct read and write into that specific location memory. Do you get the same results here? Oh, yes. Yeah, perfectly. Okay. And when, when, you, when you check the output, it's, it's exactly what a human would write if it was in assembly. Awesome. So fantastic stuff. So you don't have to rely on your hand rolled <laughs> mem copy you were just telling <laughs> us about. Yeah, I that, that that uses so that is actually still used whenever you're setting whenever you're doing a a, a copy um construct. Um that's still that's that still calls into standard mem copy and then that'll fall into my implementation. Okay. Um, what about exceptions? They're notorious in game development. Yeah, how does that? Oh, notorious, aren't they? <laughs> um, <laughs> so 
we have two um, different builds of GCC and the GCC toolchain available for the GBA. We have the ARM official one, and then we have the community one. Right. And unfortunately, the community one, which is a dev kit ARM, was compiled with exceptions enabled. Um, so if you're using dev kit ARM, you have exceptions uh, if you ever want them. Um, and, and they work. They work as long as your linker script has set up everything to handle C++ exceptions, they'll work okay. perfectly fine. Um, and it's, it's kind of spooky seeing the assembly output and the way it jumps back up a call stack. Um, but as soon as you use the ARM official GNU toolchain, you lose except you lose exceptions entirely, which is kind of a kind of a shame. Um, but we're games, so the tradition here is exceptions are evil. Right. <laughs> so if you're going to write a game, I feel like you should keep the tradition. <laughs> That's interesting, though. But it does work if you choose the community. You said the community. Yes, the dev the dev kits ARM um, uh, build of GCC. Okay. Uh, the issue is the uh, the glib and uh, the glibc, I believe it's called. Right. Um, those have been compiled with exceptions in the community version, um, but in the official ARM, it was compiled no exceptions. So, which version of GCC are you all working with? Ooh, <laughs> the latest at the moment. Um, <laughs> so, 13? I'm I'm uh, I'm using the ARM official one at the moment, and I updated it the other day. So, I think it's now th I think it's now thirteen actually. 13.1, um, then it should be, it sounds I like. so, yeah. Wow. So, I mean, you could be toying with C++23 features, C++, I don't think anything from C++26 is in 13.1 yet. Well, not officially, but that brings us back around to the fact that you said you're relying on some GCC language extensions that hmm. have interesting help for you. So. Would you have? Would you like to uh, dig into that a little bit? <laughs> uh, the the there is a problem with uh, with uh, register allocation um, and the and the ARM procedure call standard. So how ARM handles functions is has a bit of text in there that kind of ruins the way GCC handles uh, returning structs and passing structs. Oh, interesting. Um, so if, if, you're single, if your single member of a struct is a fundamental type, then it's going to be passed by register uh, perfectly fine. Right. Um, as soon as you add another member there and the ARM procedure call center completely breaks down. Oh. Luckily, there's a GCC extension uh, the vector vector extensions. I'm able to use that to repack um, all of the struct fields. Say there's like a struct that's 12 bytes long. I can then pull myself a uh, vector of 16 bytes and then repack that structure into the vector and be guaranteed that this will now be passed by register because a vector is considered a fundamental type. Probably not 16 bytes. That's probably a bit too much. Um, but oh no, sixty bytes would work. Two yeah. to four registers, basically, you're saying. Yes, yeah, so four registers um, are available in the procedure call standards to be uh, for function arguments. For um, return, for arguments or returns. For arguments and return. Okay. Okay. So that's like the scratch space. Is that that's the ARM thirty two calling conventions? Did they change in sixty four? Do you know? Probably. I've not looked at sixty four. Yeah. It's too modern. I, I can't do ask. old stuff on it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> uh, I've had to do some ARM stuff at work, actually. Um, I won't get into it, though. It's too, too much. Too old. It's too new. I need, need, need old ARM. <laughs> I will say is, um, well, I mean, I wrote an ARM emulator. It's not complete, but I did it largely just to understand the architecture. Mm. And it is very interesting architecture. And uh, it's enlightening. Like, I'll, I'll just encourage anyone listening. Like, if you... I have an interest in any other CPU architecture. Just start trying to implement the instruction set once and see how it goes. Like you don't have to be fancy, and and it's you'll learn a lot, a lot. Absolutely, completely agree. All right, so uh, let's see. What else do you want to talk about for GBA development? Oh, I want to give a special shout out to uh, Compiler Explorer. That has. <laughs> That that tool has done more for teaching assembly than any book written in history about any subject. Um, <laughs> it's such an invaluable tool. 
and even in the in the DBA community, if you want to demonstrate something, so my mem copy routine was almost exclusively tested in a compiler explorer. I'd, I'd write some C to kind of get a feel of what's what is what is possible. Uh, but then I can literally almost copy paste the instruction output, um, change the syntax to the correct one, and then start hand tuning everything and moving stuff around. And yes, I absolutely love Compiler Explorer. So if if if, if people here aren't fans, become a fan of Compiler Explorer. Check it out; it's amazing. I don't know how you could watch this channel and not know what Compiler Explorer. <laughs> it's at is. least a text editor. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I abuse it. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what about uh, the future of your uh, Game Boy? G I'm sorry. What is it called? GB uh, AG GBA HPP. Yeah. Okay. What's a name? <laughs> GBA I, HPP. Oh, I was right, trying right. to use every letter of the alphabet, uh, but can fix fit that into six characters. <laughs> right. um, yeah, so I've just uh, released a new version. Um, it was a bit of a complete rewrite to try and take advantage of uh, some of the bitcast availability um, now that C++20 is more ubiquitous. Uh, the next step is to start documenting everything uh, uh, because <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. There's no documentation at all. So I introduced someone to this, uh, to how to code to the GBA. And they see all these strange characters everywhere because of all the ways that the documentation has named the registers. Uh, so I need to actually write the human interpretation of what all these mystical registers mean. Do you have tests if you don't have documentation? <laughs> Ooh, how, how could you? <laughs> how embarrassing. Um, that's one of my contribu um, contributions to the MGBA emulator was a small testing framework. Um, unfortunately it's a bit too difficult to set up. Um, so right. I can, I've ended up being forced to just write local tests and cause if I were to then publish them to the GitHub, it's, I would feel obliged to try and fix the issues that make it difficult to work, um, through an action. So I'll, I'll need to, I'll, I'll need to solve that sin that I've uh, caused for myself. No tests. Um, I, did I didn't mean to, uh, you know, I was <laughs> just curious spot. how you approach it, some of the difficulties there. It is, yeah, the lack of tests is probably the worst part, though. Um, okay. For my other library, AGB ABI, that's um, all written in C and assembly. And mm -hmm. the amount of regressions that occur is far too frequent to the point that out of frustration, I said, I'm writing a not a proper test, but a demo application with my own testing framework header to be extremely minimal. And we're just, every time we find a problem, we're going to log it there, rerun it. And it's, it's still a pain in the backside. Um, but I, I'm well aware that uh, the lack of test is just almost fatal to some of the stuff that we're trying to do. I will give a quick shout out, I guess, to the authors of Vice, the Commodore emulator suite. Um, cause when I was playing with my Commodore 64 C++ stuff, I could write the source code that I wanted to test, uh, run it through my compiler scripting tools and then execute it on vice and from the command line script and say, I want you to execute for exactly 1000 CPU cycles yeah. and then dump this region of memory when you're done. So I could compare that the region of memory was exactly what I wanted it to be after the code executed and was able actually to build an automated test suite with it. Uh, it took some, you know, a lot of experimentation to get there, but I was pretty pleased when I got it working. Hmm, that sounds quite, quite useful. I wish, I wish I had that. We probably do with some of the scripting stuff coming into MGBA. Um, but the solution I found was to, uh, uh, <laughs> The, the 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 MGBA uh, I think they call it what was it like a a wrapper or something? It will load up the emulator core. Um, it'll run your game, but it knows that when the return statement is hit, the value is going to be in a particular register. So your right. test can say, once I finish running, what's the value in this register? And right. I give it a pass or a false, true true false. Did, did it actually succeed the test? All right. So assuming, uh, someone watching this is now they want to jump right into GBA development, go ahead and like, where should they go? Where's this community <laughs> centered around? It's a uh, GBA dev.net. We have a uh, discord server and everyone is 
unreasonably friendly. People will really try and help you get set up. Um, <laughs> people go really above and beyond to help each other out there. Uh, yes. We have so many tools as well available. Um, you don't just have to use my library. Uh, there's Brutano, there's the C libraries, and there's other languages available as well. Um, some people have been experimenting with Rust as well. So if you're into Rust, that's Rust. available. Okay. <laughs> oh, I will. I, I'm going to get on my podium here. Um, <laughs> this is going to. Rust people might hate me for saying this. Um, oh, no. The output for LLVM for ARM32 is awful right now. And uh, everyone who gets who starts a Rust project, in the back of my head, I'm thinking the assembly. It's it's terrible. I, this I is a Rust and, specific problem. C it's, it's, with LLVM are ARM is it's fine. It's a um, LLVM problem, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Okay. So every every language targeting at LLVM is gonna have uh, awful output. But it works and a lot of people are enjoying development. Um, so okay. that's perfectly fine. Yeah, I was I was had intended at some point to ask why you kept saying GCC and never talked about <laughs> Clang, but I, I target that. Clang uh, just to keep my code healthy. Um, <laughs> okay, not the output healthy. That's not healthy at all. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, if there's anything else you want to say, go ahead and go for it. And... Yeah, I made a little. Little ah. demo ROM earlier for you, Jason. So what is what is is this, is this, is this some it's, assembly in the background, right? Yeah, it's literally your YouTube header on a on a Game Boy Advance. Oh, okay. okay <laughs> that uses nice. one of the bitmap modes. So it's the simplest thing to get an image up and running. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.